After two days in the wilderness, we have reached the remote border between Sudan and Ethiopia. My fear is that our contacts will have found getting here as difficult as we have. But to my huge relief, there is a Dr. Livingston. You must be. <laughs> sorry we're late. <laughs> and I'm sorry my trousers are ripped. This is, we're trying to pull the vehicle out of, yeah. out of sort of where we had a stuff and we had trees across the road. And... His name is Graham Hancock, a British journalist. We had the same Did you? You mean it's as bad going that way? It's awful. Yeah. Is it really? It's really dark. Oh, no. it's dark. So you arrived here very late as well. We got here at two in the morning. Yeah. And uh, we've been, we've, we've just been kind of hanging out, oh, waiting, right. waiting for you to take. Yeah. Well, first of all, we've got to clear customs on, on both sides. Do we? You'll have no problem on that side. Really? Yeah. Uh, there's, there aren't any, there, yeah. there's nobody there to check it. If, if if we have no problems and we can get going, and we we have few problems on the Sudanese side, mm. how quickly can we get to somewhere where you know? Can we get to Gonda? We can get to Gonda, but, but uh, it will take us, uh, I would guess, not less than eight hours. Oh, really? So we won't that's, if we, that's if we get rolling straight away. Yeah. The, the problem is driving this road in the dark. Yeah, right. In the daylight, it's acceptable. Yeah. In the dark, um, you keep getting bogged down just because you can't yeah. see what you're getting into. How far is the road bad? I'm afraid it's bad for um, the best part of uh, 200 kilometers. Is that most of the way to Gonda? Yes, and then it starts to get good. I think I'll go home. <laughs> I want to go home. <laughs> In order to avoid the war-torn south of Sudan, our route now takes us in a wide detour away from 30 degrees, across the highlands of Ethiopia to Gonda, Lake Tana, and on to the capital, Addis Ababa. Next morning, after spending a mercifully short night in a village of mud huts, we're on the move early. The landscape is a surprise, lush green meadows, and the first mountains we've seen since Norway. We're here because of a civil war in Sudan, but until four months ago, one just as fierce was being waged in Ethiopia. The war may be over, but not everyone has surrendered. This lonely countryside provides perfect cover for bandits and privateers. We're accompanied everywhere by soldiers. The guns are loaded. In the villages, there are more obvious signs of the ruinous war. The children have not been to school for years. There's little work. Shelter is basic and food is scarce. We stop for a breakfast cuppa along with our armed escorts. Thank you. Cheers. The youngest, politest, least aggressive army I've ever seen. Have you had experience of, of anyone being shot at or stopped on these roads? There's constant incidents on, on these roads and in other roads in Ethiopia where lone vehicles, particularly travelling at night, are stopped and the vehicle is either stolen or the contents are stolen. Sometimes people get killed. Sometimes they'll attack more than one vehicle. Um, and therefore it's considered a, a sensible precaution to, to send along a few armed guards with a, with a convoy. Yeah. Who, who pays the wages of the guards? Well, these, these people draw no salary. They're, they're they're entirely a volunteer army. None of them have, um, have any income from it at all. They just get their food and their accommodation and cigarettes. 
How old are they? I would say these kids are, are not more than 18, 16 mm. to 18. Mm. And, and it's a curious fact that those who, who successfully overthrew the dictatorship were almost all kids of this age. Mm. A year ago, uh, Mengistu, the former president, was, was heading the largest army in sub-Saharan Africa. It was a massive dictatorship, mm. huge security apparatus. Nobody would have believed that he could be removed mm. by a bunch of kids from the hills. Can you sense it when you look around or you come into a village like this? Can you sense there's a sort of different atmosphere? That people De have in? Definitely. I mean, I've been travelling around this country for years and the atmosphere is the, is the most noticeable change, the, mm. the, the feeling of relief mm. that people um, feel that they're in control of their own lives again. Ethiopia continues to provide surprises. I don't think any of us associated the place with floods. mountain air and the beauty of the scenery is welcome. It's easy to forget this is not quite the paradise it seems. Our vehicle becomes separated from the rest. Though we must wait for them to rejoin us, a roadside stop is highly risky. Everyone breathes a little easier when the convoy catches up with us. Now at least we're moving targets. We head hell for leather out of the unstable border country to the comparative safety of the first sizeable settlements. This yeah. is the place where they go. This is their village. This is this where they live. Well, around here. Nearby. Different. different you get any out? What will we do without you? Thanks very much. Thanks very much for looking after us. Okay, we got through safe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Give these men promotion straight okay. away. Okay. Great. They're hey, ace. Make them sergeants. Thank you. Okay. Thanks yeah. a lot. Hey. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you. What a fine army. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. There's more. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll know who to ask for next time we come around. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Cheers. They're happy now. They're suddenly happy. I can understand why. So you're going to eat and yeah, eat and sleep and everything I want to do. Back, back where the air is sensibly cool. Yeah, and it's rained. This is significant because it actually has, it's just rained. There's been a colossal thunderstorm. Indeed, hailstones have fallen. Thank you. Thank you. Just giving the weather forecast. Hailstones have fallen. I think it's the first rain that we've had certainly for about since, since northern Norway. So we've been dry too long, especially in the Sudan. So we go on. Does that now mean that we're 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 safe now? We're out of, yes, we're the out road, of bandit country. There's about 65 kilometres between here and Gondor, yeah. and it's safe. It's safe. Um, and uh, yes, yeah. it's it's all okay. a lie. Actually, it's the most dangerous 65 <laughs> yeah. kilometres of all. It's like everyone tells us, oh, the next bit of road, that's fine. Next yes. 100 miles, that's a good road. That's where we, we end up yet. getting hijacked. This has been one hell of a journey. Okay, so um, we go. Do you want to come? Gonda. Once the capital of Ethiopia, Gonda is like somewhere out of a different age.
I'm not exactly surprised to learn that the country works to a different calendar. It's only 1984 here. Through the smoke and chilly mist loom the twin pillars of Ethiopian history, church and empire. Well, this is the castle compound, as they call it, in Gonda. It was established in 1635 when Gonda became the capital city of Ethiopia. Yeah. Emperor at that time was called Fasilidas, and he built the first castle here. But over the next 150 years, the successive emperors each decided to build their own massive castle as well. But the, the, the tradition of, of emperors is very old in this country. It goes back well before recorded history. And I mean, for the last, last 750 years, there's just been an unbroken line of emperors until Haile Selassie yeah. in 74. But that, was, um, that must make Ethiopia unique in Africa. Have completely the, unique. Yeah. Yeah. Going Complete, back. Completely and it wasn't, unique. during that time, wasn't colonised, was it? No, mm, the was country's really, never, never been mm, colonised. The Italians um, tried. There's a, you know, there seems to be European influence here. Where, where's well, that come there from? were Portuguese in, in Ethiopia. Mm. They'd been invited in to help an emperor um, deal with a Muslim threat, and they stayed on, mm. and uh, there's a possible Portuguese influence in these castles. Presumably they were despots, were they? They didn't have any... You could say, almost without exception, that yeah. all Ethiopian emperors were, were despots. Um, very dictatorial, very single-minded. Their so, word was law. Was there any attempt to you know, form a constitution or limit their power? <laughs> a constitution was created by Haile Selassie, but one of the main clauses was that his power was inviolable and could not be disputed. <laughs> Very clever, <laughs> yes. This is uh, Tafara, the unhappiest lion in Africa. Yeah. He, he was owned by Haile Selassie, the former emperor, and I believe he's about 20 years old now. He spent so, most of those 20 years in, in here. They got rid of the emperor, but they didn't get rid of the lion. They didn't get rid of the lion, the symbol of imperial power, no. I mean, that's really horrible in there. That's disgusting, isn't mm. it? A terrible, terrible place to keep any animal. Yeah, and he's... the flies all around him. It seems almost like a kind of punishment because he was associated with the emperor. Yeah. The surrounding mountains have enabled Ethiopia to develop in its own individual way. There's little on the streets of Gonda to suggest anything much has changed since the emperors built their castles. The country has remained traditional, agricultural, and apart from Mussolini's brief invasion in the 1930s, largely cut off from exposure to the West. But not everyone wants to turn their back on the outside world. Mohammed, you listen to the radio? Yes, I listen to the radio, particularly BBC. <laughs> do you? Yeah. The World Service? Yeah, BBC World Service, yeah. What do you like to listen to? Uh, I have a great interest uh, to listen to football, particularly England football, huh? club football. Do you have a team, a favourite team in England? A uh, team in England, that is uh, Manchester United. Eh? Ah, yeah. Uh, I love this match. <laughs> And did you, did you hear the football last Saturday? Did you listen to it? Uh, in case of uh, some problems, uh, I didn't hear the football. So you can't tell me whether my team won? The reason? My team is Sheffield Wednesday. I see. Do you know about them? Yeah, I know about them. We beat Manchester United in the League Cup last season. <laughs> yes. I was there. Ah, uh, yeah, yes. So <laughs> bad luck. <laughs> There is an urgent need I have to attend to before I leave Gonda. The successful semi-circumnavigator must make sure all his equipment is in working order. <laughs> More in hope than anything else, I take my trousers, ripped in action in the Sudan, to a local tailor. <laughs> Only they've got to last me. South Pole. I don't know if he's got any blue thread. Oh, he's having a go straight away. This is great. <laughs> now, now a beautiful that is brilliant. That's about sort of one minute ten seconds flat. 
and it's completely invisible. Think of him. Two, two burrs, an Ethiopian burr. I'm still on Sudanese money, so... A burr is approximately 50 US cents. Is it? Yeah, or a third, 30 pence. So this is... Um, two of them is about a dollar, yeah. 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 There you are. Two? Thank you very much. That's really good. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Look at that. <laughs> Near perfection. We leave Gondo heading south to one of the least known and yet most important places in Africa. This is Lake Tana, where the Blue Nile rises. It's a natural reservoir, providing water for Sudan and Egypt. It's the only lake in Africa where these papyrus reed boats are found. Their design has been traced back to ancient Egypt. They look perilously fragile, yet they've been crossing the lake for thousands of years. The wood is in great demand. It'll be used for heating, cooking, building, and fencing. In the green highlands round Lake Tana, Graham and I are taken on an expedition. The countryside is no different from the days when the Victorians came this way, risking their lives to find the source of the Nile. I'm risking little more than a clean shirt, but I'm realising my first childhood ambition, to be an explorer, to see strange and wonderful things in strange and wonderful countries. Incredible. I've never seen anything like that in my life. It's a huge body of water. It's only really just left the lake, hasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Is the lake, and Lake Tana is the source of the Effect, Nile. Effectively, yeah. yes. It's, it, it drains a lot of yeah. the mountains round about, and yeah. most of it pours out down this, uh, this river here. Oh, that's, that's absolutely an extraordinary. The power of that down there. You can see how it manages to reach Egypt. Well worth leaving the North Pole for this. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's a first. I've never seen anything, anything as powerful as that. Once on the road south, we're back to reality. A poor country, exhausted by years of war and misgovernment. Three days after entering Ethiopia, we have our last sight of the River Nile which we followed for two and a half thousand miles. It makes a spectacular exit in a gorge a mile deep, spanned by a single bridge carrying the road to the capital. Our safe arrival in Addis Ababa marks the end of the most difficult stretch of the journey since the pole. We should be feeling pretty pleased with ourselves. So should Addis. Four months earlier, Colonel Mengistu and his tin-pot Soviet-style regime were chased out of the country after 17 years. The monuments that every good Ethiopian was expected to admire and respect are now being taken for scrap. But there's little sign of any joie de vivre. The country should be having a ball, stripping away the past, 
but no one seems to have the energy. Addis Ababa is a city still in shock, unable to comprehend quite what has happened to it. I suppose it must be depressing to realise that everything you were meant to believe in was false. That the great statue of Lenin that was the centrepiece of your capital is now lying on the corporation tip. Discarded. Redundant. <laughs> Determined to be tolerant, the new left-wing government has allowed a demonstration. It's taking place in the square, which Mengistu used only for military parades. The demonstrators are angry at plans to partition the country, and they're staging the biggest peaceful protest Ethiopia has ever seen. Suddenly there's gunfire and people start to run. No one knows what it means, but that's the way the city is. The only point of stability and continuity seems to be the church. On a wet Sunday morning, over a thousand people have come out to worship here. Christianity has continued unbroken in Ethiopia for 1,600 years. All the more remarkable as everywhere else around is Muslim. The rituals of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church have many similarities with the Jewish tradition. The connection goes back to the Queen of Sheba. According to the legend, she was an Ethiopian and mother of King Solomon's son. The drum they call the Kibero and the Silver Sistra are straight out of the Old Testament. Next day, we're on the move again, heading south on the unaccustomed luxury of a metalled road. But we haven't left the church behind. These roadside priests are appealing for funds. They often collect money by upturning their umbrellas and catching contributions. I'm hitching a ride with Oxfam, an organisation I've supported for years. Nick Rosevear has promised to show me how my money's being spent. What can Ethiopia itself do to improve food production? Well, the policies of the new government are ones which I think will help a lot to get the agricultural sector much more efficient. Something like 90, 92% of the population yeah. are dependent on agriculture, and the vast majority of that number yeah. are simply produced for their own needs. If they were encouraged and were able to produce a small surplus, <laughs> and be able to sell it at a at market value. How much do you think that would improve matters? I'm sure that it would improve things a lot. It would, it would take time, but it's not going to happen next year. Yeah. It's not going to happen the year after that. It's not going to happen in five years. But progressively, with incentives for people to produce more than they just need to eat yeah. for their family, yeah. eventually Oxfam hopes to you know, yeah. do itself out of a job, but really. 
In these southern provinces, drought is not the main problem. This creek provides water for local people, but the water is tainted. Animals use it, vehicles drive through it, and it has to be carried over long distances, traditionally the woman's job. For a total outlay of £2,000, raised in this case by the Comic Relief Charity, water now comes direct to this village. A 90-foot well has been sunk and pure water pumped up by the simplest technology. I'd give that to my own children, and I'd have the beer. It really is very good. Hang on. In theory, the return on this modest investment is better health for everyone, and for the women, extra time and freedom. My own state of health is currently uneasy, but the hospitality keeps coming. This is the local, um, the local bread. Is it a bread? It's, uh, it's more like a pancake. Mm. More like a car seat cover. <laughs> so you just tear a bit off. It's tear a bit very, off. very strange texture, isn't it? Mm. A bit rubbery. A bit rubbery, and uh, dip it in one of dip these. Dip it in the sauce. What's the least harmful for a man um, in my delicate uh, well, metabolic situation? Potato, if you Potato, okay. <laughs> if you think you can bear it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you have to mm. eat with your right hand only in Ethiopia, is that? People do, but it's not because it's your only clean hand. It's not quite such a taboo. To touch your food with your left in, hand. In yeah. Sudan and Egypt, it's very, mm. very bad to touch food with the left hand. Isn't it? mm. It's one of the best car seat covers I've ever had. <laughs> Sour, isn't it? Well, it's pounded and then fermented and then used yeah. as a sort of uh, pancake mm. mixture. Mm. Is it is it particularly Ethiopian? Yeah, uniquely so. Uniquely. Mm. Yeah. They, you they, don't, they don't export it. Else. Maybe we could start a Tef franchise. In the busy little town of Shashimani, a moody walk through the streets becomes a major event. The apathy I saw in Addis doesn't seem to have any place here. As far as the locals are concerned, the circus has come to town. There's really nothing else to do but enjoy it as much as they are. Where did you get that? I'll continue my gentle walk. No, all the other time in my What do you do here? The end of a long day's travelling. Hotel check-ins are reminders that even time itself is not the same in Ethiopia as anywhere else. 29. Mm. One. One. One, again, isn't it? When the rest of the world adopted the Gregorian calendar, Ethiopia somehow got left behind by seven years and eight months, as it happened. Outside, by Lake Awasa, it could be 1984 BC, for all I care. It's a place of soothing tranquility, where limbs are rested, 
brains cleared and hopefully stomachs settled. Surrounded by all this, the problems of the journey ahead seem unimportant. It's a short-lived illusion. Hello. Hello. I'm reading from Awasa in Ethiopia, and I've just had some bad news. I've heard that the friend of mine who's going to meet us all at the border, um, yeah, at the Kenyan border at, at Moyali, um, he's been taken seriously ill and he's in hospital, so he won't be able to come and meet us. Yeah. Is there any... You hear me? Yeah. Is there any chance that you could send vehicles up to the border to meet us? It would be, yes, it would be the end of this week, um, fr uh, Friday, probably Friday morning. Right, well, if you, if you can do what you can. Yeah, I appreciate that. We're promised some sort of emergency help, but first we must get ourselves to the border, 330 miles away. Nick has returned to Oxfam headquarters and we're left to face the realities of travel in southern Ethiopia. There are no trains, precious few buses, so it's time to hitch. You can take us some of the way, is that right? Yes. He, he, he will take us... Yes, he, he says he'll take us as far as he's going, wherever that may be. 15 yeah. kilometres from okay. here, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, there doesn't seem to be anything else at the moment, so we'll, we'll, we'll take this and see. Right. All right, OK. Well, the Lord Mayor's show, isn't it? Well, National Westminster Bank, left. Well, I've seen on the embankment. <laughs> that's a great hat that I like so much. Oh dear, that's bad. Oi. a terrible loss. This lovely stretch of road is almost all that exists of the great Pan-African Highway, a post-colonial dream that never became reality. Rather like Ethiopian public transport. A hitchhiker's nightmare, a hot day, an empty road, and 7,000 miles still to go. Somewhere at the end of the road is the border town of Moyali, if our Kenyan vehicles are there, we can embark on the 400-mile run to the equator and Nairobi. Fortune favours the brave. 11 hours after setting out from Lake Awasa, at the end of our 11th day in Ethiopia, we've almost reached country number 10. Well, down here is uh, the main street of Moyali, which is the frontier town between Ethiopia and Kenya. We've got here, thanks to uh, various vehicles, of which this is the most comfortable, uh, 
We just hope now that the vehicles that I rang up for from A and K will be here to meet us. Oh, uh, but at least we're here. And if you don't, don't mind, I should go and have some back surgery immediately. I never feel comfortable at borders, and adding to my discomfort this morning is the fear that there just might not be anyone to meet me. But how could a company with a name like Abercrombie and Kent let you down? Oh, Ika Alpha. Oh, dear. Hi, Michael. I'm Michael glad Palin. you could make it. Oh, pleased, pleased to see you. I really am. So you got the message and all that. Yeah, we got the yeah, message. Yeah. Thank goodness. Well, we, we were a bit stuck when I heard late. about Monty. How is he? He's much better. Is he? Much better. Great. You might be able to see him when you get to Nairobi. Oh, that's good. That would be oh, because the news sounded very bad. Yeah. Ah, so. This is Abercrombie or Kent? Ah, oh, Mr. Abercrombie. Nice to see Mr. you. Mr. Palin, nice, 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 nice to see Welcome. you. Very nice to see Good. you. Don't know how nice. Good. So, uh, well, it's country number 10. Shall, mm -hmm. we, shall we go? Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's get everything <laughs> sorted. It okay. shouldn't take long. Let's go. In contrast to the bleakness of their surroundings, the tribes of northern Kenya love decoration and display. These are the Samburu, the word means butterfly. I spent time with them nine years ago making a film called The Missionary. Today I'm back in the village of Larata to see if the roof we built for the school is still there. They've been told to expect a celebrity. It's a wonderful welcome, but not for me. They all love Wendy. Norman Garwood's work for you. Let's have a look inside. <laughs> hello, good morning. I last came here. Oh, hello, good morning. Oh. I'm honoured, I'm honoured. Beautifully done. You must have been practicing for weeks. I was here nine years ago to make a film. And during the making of the film, our technicians, our carpenters, put a roof on the school here. So I've come back to see it, and I'm glad the roof is still on, and it's nice to be here again. And now, do any of you know where I came from to make the film? What country? Anyone know what country I come from? Mm. Yeah. England. Very good. What's your name? Mm. Solomon. Solomon. Excellent. Wisdom of Solomon there. I come from England. And does anyone know what's, what is the capital city of England? London. London. Very good. Man in the lovely hat over there. Well, I come from London, England, and this time I've come from somewhere different. And I'm going to show you where I've come from on this world. I've brought my own world with me. And... You can give me some encouragement if you like, you know. <laughs> Say, come on, come on! Okay. Yeah. Okay. Come on! <laughs> oh! <laughs> right, we did it. Now, last time I came, we left a roof. And this time, I'd like to give something to the school, because it's a school that's very close to my heart. 
and I'll always remember it. So I want you to have my glow. And this has been with me round the world and this far down the world. I think it'd be very nice if you have it here. Would you like this for your school? Yes. yes. It's very useful. You can look at it, you can see the rest of my journey, and you can also play football with it. So there you are. That's right. Wait. <laughs> oh! I may have left the world behind in Lorata, but I'm also about to leave behind hundreds of miles of dusty dirt track. Where the good road begins, so does old colonial Africa, clustered round Mount Kenya, 17,000 feet high and bang on our halfway mark. The equator divides the world into two hemispheres. This is the northern hemisphere, and this is the southern hemisphere. If you drain a sink when you are on the northern side of the equator, and you wash the water as it drains, you will see that the water always rotates clockwise. This phenomenon is caused by the rotation of the Earth. The effect becomes stronger according to how far you move to the north or to the south, and becomes weaker according to how close you go towards the line. So that's why we have to give some distance from the equator so that the rotation can be noticeable. This is known as the Coriolis effect and Peter Mukiri has given this same lecture every day for the last six years. It's delivered in the burnt out shell of an old hotel. The equator used to run through the middle of the bar. I bet they were always floating matchsticks in their beer. So. This changes to counterclockwise, indicating that now we are on the southern hemisphere. <coughs> so now we are right on the equator, and as we drain the water, you'll see there'll be no rotation. It just drains straight down, and that's how we prove that we are right on the equator. It does work. Nairobi is the centre of the safari business. Safari is a Swahili word meaning journey. Now it's come to mean a certain type of journey where animals meet tourists and vice versa. And a highly competitive business it is too. Hello. Jumbo. Jumbo. Um, I'm going on safari okay. for a few days and mm -hmm. I've been told that if I come to your shop called Pro, yes. I'll get a free I Love Kenya sticker with my safari gear. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, so what, what do I need? What is safari gear? Uh, you, you start from Trousers, shirts, jackets, shoes, socks, everything. So it's kind of everything? Yes. Bring your own underwear, though. No, we got that as we well. got that as well. In khaki. Yeah. yeah. Well... Uh, you want to start with the jackets? Uh, sure, yeah. Sure, yeah, absolutely. This is called a photojournalist vest. Yes, oh, I'd okay. like to be a photojournalist. The pockets are basically there to put film, extra films. Whiskey flask there, yeah. gin there. Oh, that's... This That's is fun, isn't it? Yeah. This is camouflage. Yeah. We used to have the original camouflage, but then the government banned it because because of the army and the air force. Of oh, people getting muddled up with yeah. the, with soldiers as well. Right, yeah. Right. This is called a zip off trouser. It's got a zip mm. there. You remove it and you can make it into shorts. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's multi-purpose. Yeah. And there's this. Oh, the light. What's the me this one? Yeah. There's this design which has got the map of Kenya on it. Oh yes. So it's it's a map as well. You yes. can sort of find your way around. It looks very much like the uh, Out of Africa style. Yes, it is. Yeah. And uh, even the uniforms in that movie, we did them. Did you? Yes. Really? Yeah. 
Well, I think the only thing wrong is the hat. Hmm? From Nairobi, we descend the eastern rim of the Great Rift Valley, a dramatic 2,000-mile split in the Earth's crust, running the length of East Africa. Wildlife thrives on the valley floor, but we all have one eye on the weather. It looks as if the rains have broken early. Maybe this is why it all looks green and cosy, like Surrey with hippos. In fact, it's the Mara River in Kenya's Masai Mara National Park. Abercrombie and Kent have valuable camping rights here. Their vehicles, bogged down by rain on the way, have only just arrived. This is the old-fashioned way to see wild animals. No hotels or lodges, just simple tents and canvas showers. It's basic, authentic and terribly expensive. <laughs> The team that brought me down from the Ethiopian border are looking after me here as well. Kella Louis, the driver, and Wendy, who describes herself as an old colonial hand. Today they're joined by a few extra helpers. Patrick, the maitre de camp, has safari with Hemingway, Marshal Tito, and Prince Charles. It's a palace. This is clearly going to be unlike any other camping holiday I've ever been on. Thank God. There's a light here. Unfortunately, the jacuzzi is already full. <laughs> As we're going to be here a day or two, I think I'd better go and introduce myself. You know, I swear they can understand every word I say. And there's something about their expressions which makes me feel that I know what they're saying too. Oh no, not another film crew. Looking to be alone? It's beautifully cruel for filmmaker Warwick Thornton in The Beach, Isolation in Paradise, tonight at 10.55. And his series, Mystery Road, starts in ten minutes. Scary, yes. <laughs> <laughs>